The name of this uh, blog this time is going to be Who Wants to Be a Tomb Runner? Who Wants to Be a Tomb Runner? And I want to begin with um, John, uh, verse, uh, chapter 20 and verse 1 through 8. <clears throat> John, Gospel of John, 20, verse 1 through 8. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went in to the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, and wrapped together in a place by itself, then went in also that other disciple which first, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and he believed. Um, I want. I'm going to change this story a little bit from being a pre-gospel story to a New Testament story. And here's what I mean: these guys didn't know anything about the victory of the cross at this stage. They didn't know anything about uh, being dead with Christ. They didn't know anything about Jesus being our life and, they, uh, and Christ living in us. They didn't know any, hardly any of the things that we take for granted. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this account and I'm going to put it in the context of what if these guys did know? What if they actually knew what they were running toward and running for. And um, just so you know, we actually have ample scriptures, some of which I will um, relate to, uh, to this story as we go along that talk about running and about going after the Lord in this, in this manner. So um, they ran to the tomb and what did they discover there? Well, in the context of the New Testament, they discovered, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Are you following the way I'm putting this? That if, it, if this happened with them having full knowledge of what the New Testament was declaring, this is what they would have discovered had they arrived at that tomb that we are dead, that we are crucified with Christ, that the old man is, uh, and the old nature is gone. They would have discovered the old nature is gone. <clears throat> and so, um, so let's see. Um, my thought was, uh, I noticed how they both ran together, it says, and John got there first, but he didn't go in. He didn't go in and he didn't find out what was in the tomb, what was in the sepulcher, what was in the place of death. He paused. He hesitated. He waited. And, and Peter, who apparently, as a fisherman, isn't used to running. He's used to fishing and being in a boat, and there's not a lot of room to run in a boat. He was a little bit behind, and when he got there, he didn't hesitate at all. He went into the place of death. He immediately went in and uh, went in to discover Jesus. He didn't just go into any old tomb. He didn't just go into any old death. He went into Jesus' tomb, and he went in to discover Jesus and the reality of Jesus, and particularly if you're keeping this in a New Testament reality where they, they understand these things and they're pursuing them and they're running after them. And so um, I wrote, be first to see that death is true to God's purpose, that it is true to God's purpose and that it leads to life. And this is a big deal. This is a big deal. It seems like those among us that preach and share this, 
that all that people get out of it is that it's about death and it's about death. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. And Christ lives in me. I want Jesus to live in me. That's why I'm pursuing the cross. That's why I pursue the Lord. This is the way I pursue the Lord. This is the Jesus that I know. It's the Jesus of the cross that leads to the... And you could say it's the Lamb of God on the altar. Or you could say it's Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. Or you could say it's slaughtered Lamb on the throne. But whatever it is, it's His life that I'm after. And, 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 and an end to my life. And that's important to me. That's important. That's not important to everybody. Some people are really slow to, you know, when they hear about the, the tomb and everything, Mary Magdalene comes, they're really slow. They don't even leave. Well, they don't even leave immediately. They, well, you know, I don't know if I want to hear this death stuff. I don't know if I want to, you know, I, uh, you know lose my life. I... Uh, so they, they, they continue to meddle around and fool around with their life. And others will make a, a, a slow pace to get there um, and, and take their time and maybe stop along the way. And others might even pick up the pace a little bit. But Peter and John ran together. And they had one heart, and they had one goal, and they wanted to get to the tomb. They wanted to get to the place of Jesus' death. They wanted to get there, but they were also seeking life. They wanted the living Christ, but you know, you're never going to get him except at first to the place of death. The scriptures declare this over and over, you know. Um, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, I think it's 35 or 36, where it says, Thou fool, no, don't you know that that which, is, uh, that which comes forth out of a seed cannot come forth except it die? That is a, that's the, it, is, it is just foolish to run anywhere else or walk anywhere else or waste time um, you know, we say, you know, all of us, all Christians, all everywhere, I want Jesus. I want Jesus, and I want your life, Lord. And, you know, and I know we're sincere and everything. There's only one place we're going to get his life, and that's at the cross. There has to be a death, and that death has to be ours with Christ, not just our death. We're not just trying to die. We're not just trying to put ourselves to death. It is at the cross with Christ, and it is buried by baptism into death so that we run to that tomb and we go, this is my hope. This is where my life is going to spring forth. This will be my spring. This will be my resurrection. It's Jesus, and it's, and it's His life, and it's no longer I. And see, that's, that's it. That's it. Uh, and uh, what was it? Uh, also in Corinthians uh, Paul talked about this, and he said, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might may be made manifest in my mortal flesh. There is, it is just wrong, it is deeply wrong to talk about wanting Jesus to come out of us without wanting Jesus' death. It's just wrong. It's, wrong. it's wrong teaching. It's a wrong spirit. It's, everything about it is wrong because it leaves out the core reality. That seed dies, that life springs forth, and there's your spring. You leave that out, it's still you. You can call it Jesus. You can call it holy. You can call it of God. You can call it anything you want. But it's you. And God knows it's you. And the Spirit of God knows the difference. For God's sake, he, he doesn't come down. He didn't come down and land on John the Baptist. <laughs> he landed on Jesus. Jesus was the one who went into death, you know, baptism into death. Jesus is the one who went down into death, not John the Baptist. And so the dove, 
He always comes on Christ crucified. See, he's always there. He's always hovering, waiting, waiting, waiting for our heart to get in the right place and waiting for us to pick up our pace, pick up our pace. Maybe we're not fully ready. Maybe we've got our hesitances and we've got our fears and everything, but pick up the pace. Start running toward the tomb. Be a tomb runner. Start running towards that death because that's where you're going to find your life. That's where you're going to find your reality. And, uh, and when I say your reality, your reality is not in you. Your reality, you're, if it is, you're the wrong reality. You are the wrong one. Your life is meant to be bound up in a bundle with his life. And, and your, uh, your apprehension, you know, we use the word identification. Forget identification. Jesus is your life. Just forget trying to identify with that and start getting into the, the cross and into the tomb deep enough that you go, oh, my God, he didn't just die. I'm not just running to see if he died and now he's up. I, I am there to discover my death with him so that I can discover his life in me, in me, the life I now live in the flesh. Okay, well, you know, I know that we all want to be great. I know that we all want to be important. I know that we all want to um, do great things for God. Let me tell you. The only offering God's ever, ever, ever received is Christ. That's why Paul said, death worketh in me. He's talking about, but it's Christ's life. His, it is his death, and it is his life. And as long as I'm seeking my death, I'm seeking the wrong thing. I seek him, and to know him in the in, the, in his death and in the fellowship of his sufferings and, and the power of his resurrection. You see, if we're seeking to know us in those things, we'll never know us because those things do not apply to us apart from union with him. But if, we, if we're seeking to know him in the power of his resurrection, we're, we're seeking it wrong then. You have to be made conformable to his death. There has to be a death, and you have to conform to that. And you only do that by identification because it's his death. And then a resurrection happens, and the resurrection happens because uh, God raises that son that is nothing like us. Nothing. I don't care how religious we are. I don't care the best of us. And the best of us in our church, in that church, in this church, in the world, the best of us is, is a putrefying picture of a, of a, a false Christ compared to the beauty the beauty, the incredible beauty of his heart. It was just this fact of, I want the life of Jesus. I want more of the life of Jesus. And why don't I have more of his life? Why, what is wrong with me? Why don't I have more of his life? And the Spirit of God would say, you do not have more of his life because you don't have more of his death working in you. You are still pursuing something that is not you and calling it you. You are, you are pursuing a, a reality for you that is never, ever going to be you. It's him, and it's you and him. Oh, to know him, Paul said again, to know him in the power of his death, in the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable to his death, sorry, the first one, the power of his resurrection. All of it his and him. And see, 
that's the key. It's not just his death, and it's not just his resurrection, and it's not just his suffering. For us, for him, it was his. He did it all. For us, it's not his. It's him. It's him. It's oneness into him, or, or we're still making it his and us over here, and that's mine, and okay, that's me, and we're still, we're still, we're still doing this thing where, you know, there's two, and we're like an earthly marriage. The two should be one, and Jesus says there ain't no two in this union. We are one, one life, one God, one Father, one body, one everything comes down to that or it doesn't come down. It's just another form of Judaism, of, of, of going after God, seeking God, praying, reading our Bibles, attending services. Um, but where? Where will, will that heart come from? Um, I wrote here at the last, um, who will go to the place of death first? Because, okay, can I tell you who's going to go to the place of death first? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to give, you, I'm going to give this big secret away. The person that is going to run and get to that tomb and go in first is the person that believes the strongest, the most clear, has the most absolute clarity that going into this tomb and going down into this tomb is going to lead to his life in me. So I'm running with all my heart to get to Jesus. That's who, that's who gets there first. See? And the dawdlers and the people that are just playing at it and whatever, okay, well, you know, we'll be forever trying to correct the ills of carnal Christianity. But to, but to find those that are, you know, who will be, I, I wrote, who is in a hurry to get to the tomb of death? Okay, well, the next one, who wants to live by the life of Jesus? Who wants to live by the life of Jesus? <laughs> that I may know him. That I may know him. Not that I may know me. I've said that. I know. I'm repeating. But I want to know him. And and uh, when, it, when the reality comes that there is nothing, there is no Christianity, there is no God religion, there's only Christ. And the book of Hebrews comes swooping in and it says, okay, you saw the religion here, it was a picture of Christ. You see it here, you see priests, you see temple, you see offerings, you see uh, Moses, you see... Uh, journeys, you see, you know, it's, it's like, forget it. It's all Christ, and our goal is wrapped up, and I'll end with this, it's wrapped up in Jesus' prayer when he was about to go to the cross. And it was John 17, and it was the deepest prayer of his heart. Father, that we may be one, that they may be one with us, even as we are one. That there might be a oneness that is so real between me and them that we already have, <laughs> that's so clean and pure that we already have. And I, I want them in oneness. All right. Again, we can answer that prayer request for him. Instead of him answering our prayer request, we can answer that prayer request. We can say, that's it, I'm running now. I'm going to be a tomb runner. I'm heading toward the, I am running and I'm going after it. And I'm going after the Lord for him. And, and I'll find out what oneness means when I find out him. That's going to be the thing that transforms me, is him, his face. And when I see in his face the reality of this oneness, like the prodigal saw in the Father's face, so we see in Jesus' face. We see the true heart. We see the outshining of what's real in Him toward us. And 
and it's more than an invitation. It's a, um, it's like a, a, a flagman going, go! You know, and John and Peter take off. They take off with all their hearts. But when you get to the tomb, don't hesitate like John. You may be slower. You may think someone else is going to get there first or whatever. You know, all the stuff that goes through our mind. Just keep running. Peter did. <laughs> he got there. He didn't hesitate at all. He went right on in. And he saw all the stuff, and then John came in. Father, we just come to you, and I just hear the prayer, the, the incredible prayer, the heart prayer of Jesus in John 17. And everything that he taught, it's all culminated there even as he's going to go to, to the cross to make it, make it, make a way, make a way for that oneness. He's praying for it. He's praying. And he's making it his last prayer, his last prayer before he goes to the cross. And a dying man usually says the thing that's most important on their heart. Father, help us to want to answer that prayer, to answer that prayer, to be the answer of that prayer for Jesus. And Father, may we run. May we pick up our pace and start running instead of skipping or saundering. Only you can stir our hearts to want to do that. Religion pulls too hard. It pulls. Gravity pulls so hard to keep us held down to this earth. And it makes us lazy to have to get up and try to push against gravity. But Lord, tell us, tell us, get up, run the race, run the race that is set before you. Looking unto Jesus, the one who died and was mistreated and everything else, and yet rose again to make us one in spite of what he had to go through spite of the pain. Father, we just ask you to, to move in the manner of your heart in this thing. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs>